Okay, I'm, I am from Merida, Yucatan. Uh, so I, I work uh, like um, speaker or consulting with Massimo, Metronic, Metro Dolores, and Baxter. This is my conflict of interest. I come for a large flight, so I am uh, unused to the hour uh, here in, in, in Merida. It's like 7 a.m., I think, so. Merida, Yucatan is a nice place. We like so much the food that you can note that we like the food. We have a nice, a nice uh, culture, and this culture is food. So we, uh, we have many obese pa pa patients, ob obese uh, people, and short, short of neck, and difficult airway. So it's, it's uh, um, a big problem. Mexico is the world first place with childhood obesity. And Merida, Yucatan, we have the first place in Mexico, so we are the best, no? Big persons. And second place in adult obesity. This is one patient that I have that is uh, 600 kilograms. He uh, was, uh, have a problem in, in the leg, and, and, and I only put uh, him uh, regional anesthesia with ultrasound. I never see anything. This is uh, one case that it, uh, we are going to see in, in I, I think, in the workshop. This is Mara, is a syndrome, a Down syndrome uh, patient that uh, we have problems to intubate. It's, it's some of the cases that we have to manage. And we have the problem that the patients, the Mayan people, it's like, that, like, the, like the original people in Mexico, the Mayan people have many problems with opioids. They vomit, they have all of the uh, secondary effects of the drugs, so we have a huge problem with, with uh, opioids. That's the reason we start to do uh, another um, techniques, so they the get down the, the opioid uh, management. In USA, they have the opioid epidemic problem. Um, they start to... Uh, uh, put uh, opioids in the teething problem of the babies. So they used to use uh, opioids, and, and it's a, now it's a problem. We can see here, this is the CDC uh, Control and Prevention uh, Center Disease in USA. And if you see, the non-Hispanic white people are raising up of the uh, problems uh, with addiction. And the non-Hispanic black people are in a, um, in a red line, and the Hispanic people are less uh, used to have addiction of, of opioids. That, I think that's a reason, uh, that's a reason uh, culture or have a reason uh, genetic. Genetic, we have to study that. And here is another chart for uh, 2016 of our deaths of people um, non-Hispanic and white, and they are going up the deaths. So there's a huge problem. The face of the, uh, where all, all the people, when they hear that I don't use opioid, any opioid in my technique, uh, it's always the same. I, I, I am crazy. <laughs> Okay, uh, so this is the background, and okay, Emery, you have. <laughs> he always tells me that uh, iPad is uh, the problem, Mac. <laughs> Your iPad? Yes. My no, my iPad. No. <laughs> I have so many videos, I think that's the, the problem here. Okay, this is. This is the first opioid-free anesthesia. I have now like 3,200 uh, cases. Uh, I do uh, almost everything without opioids. Uh, no sedation, but uh, almost general anesthesia without opioids. And uh, we need to find a better technique. So uh, I am going to have a problem with this. Uh, can I change to my computer? See, 
Perdón. Creo que es la carga de, de, de video. Thank you, Emery. Mm -hmm. Okay, I one try more and then okay. So how is possible to do anesthesia without opioids? The first thing that, that we have to do is forgot all of we learned uh, before, no? And and be open to new knowledge. And, and new techniques. You have to know, like Emery told, uh, you have to know uh, the neurophysiology of all of our drugs and how to combine them and what is happening to the brain if I combine two, three or more drugs because of the interaction, you, we, we cannot be um, able to know what is happening uh, if, if we don't monitor the patient. So we can uh, do all of these uh, things to, um, the, um, to get down the nociception uh, um, interpretation to the brain. So uh, we can use regional anesthesia, local anesthesia, and we can use alpha-2 agonist, and we can use in the brain all of this uh, approach to uh, get down the, the opioids, the consumption of, of opioids. So here is uh, another back, time, back in time. We were in 2013 here with Emery when we met in, I, I approached to Emery to ask a question about the technique, and I, I, ha, I, uh, I was uh, like, um, I think Emery, is, he's, he's going to tell me that return back to Mexico and don't think, don't do uh, crazy things. That, that, that's the reason I come to Boston and, and started to do the paper with him. Um, this is my operating room. It's a nice operating room. I have all of the monitors so I can, I can play with numbers and colors and all of that stuff. So I have uh, in my clinical setting it's, it's um, amazing to, to give anesthesia. This is not a, a, how do you say, sencillo, I think, simple. Uh, this is not, it's not a simple technique of anesthesia, okay? This is difficult one. We, we have to be uh, all the time um, putting at attention and to the dose of the medication and, and, and be aware that we, we are doing, what, what we are doing. This is um, an example that uh, cases uh, that I used to do always in my, in my uh, hospital. So, we do pre-op 30 minutes before the surgery. Sometimes, sometimes I don't have the time, so uh, I do when the patient uh, comes to the operating room. This is a combination. Usually I have uh, dexmedetomidine, magnesium, lidocaine, propofol. Sometimes I don't use um, ketamine Sevofluran and rocuronium is, is the muscle relaxant that, that I used to use. In the post-op, we infiltrate, uh, we do wound infiltrate on all of the patient, all of the surgeries with dexmedetomidine, ketorolac, and ropivacaine. And then we uh, get the, the patient to the, to the PACU uh, to recovery. And they have available morphine if they want to, to, to use. No, the patients don't like morphine, but I, we, we use. This is a patient of 52 years old. So you can, you can see uh, the, monitoring, the monitoring that we use. You can see the patient is uh, in a good state. If, if we came back, you can see uh, a good uh, place in the any monitor and we have a patient unconscious. Here we have a problem. I 
let my resident to stay with my patient and has a similar thing that happened to Emery, that they turn up uh, the, the medication. That happens a lot of time. Uh, a, a lot of time. So the patient is, is okay in this. This is, I think, I remember this is uh, one of my first cases with neuromonitoring that I didn't be able to put rock uranium in the patient. So uh, he was breathing alone. No, he has a spontaneous ventilation. So that was a difficult thing because I always been uh, before doing with some opioid to uh, the, to get down the ventilation. So this is one of the first time. Uh, if you see propofol is in two of TCI, I know you all, all, of, uh, all of you are um, uh, European and Latin American, it's present too. So you use TCI, no? Two of propofol of TCI do you use for general anesthesia? Is, is, is the normal amount that you use often for general anesthesia? Okay, so we are in the in the same in the same thing. This is a patient of 82 years, uh, 11 hours of anesthesia. If you see, this is an old patient. You can see in the in the in the in the set line. You can you can see in a spectrogram. I, here we don't have any any uh, sympathetic uh, input in the patient. We are in 100, and then we stop the infusion, and the patient woke up like eight minutes after the surgery. So in the operating room, they uh, the neurosurgeon can evaluate the the movement of the of the of the uh, legs. No, so the patient uh, goes well. This is the mother of one of the surgeons that I work with, and she didn't have any problem. She goes to her room uh, without of pain. No, you can see uh, the waking up here was with propofol, and if you th if you see, they, they they take like seven minutes to wake up. This is an 87 male, is uh, one of the cases that I like so much. We have here a, um, a cardiac output monitorization, we have a nociception index uh, monitoring, and we can see that we, we don't uh, have problems with car cardiac out output with this combination. Most of the concern of the people is the, the use of the combination of dexmedetomidine, magnesium sulfate, and all of that. These drugs that can um, that can do problems in the patient with uh, cardiac output and and, and uh, blood pressure. So your here is a rock uranium infusion because this was a fracture, and uh, we have point point one of of TCI the of of uh, dexmedetomidine and one of TCI of propofol in this patient. If you see the chart, we, we don't use electronic chart, we use a paper chart, but I do almost in, in real time because I use my cases for, for the lecture. And if you see the patient is stable, I don't use uh, so much esmolol, I, I practically uh, never do that because it's so um, cost uh, expensive in, in Mexico. So here is male, 75 years, 75 kilograms, hypertension, diabetes, coronary bypass three years before the surgery with a fraction uh, ventricular 50% and tracheal rupture uh, two years before malampathy three and fracture in T1 to L1. We have the lumbar thoracic fixation. This, this was a difficult airway. And I, I am going to track you for the case. So if you see here, we have a hypotension. 
okay? If you can see, 56 to 33. We were using uh, like 2.5, that a huge amount of propofol in the patient. But this, this one was for the cardiac output of the patient. Then uh, we started to, uh, if you see in, in, in a second before, we changed to 0.7 because of the EEG waves and the blood pressure. And we started norepinephrine before the intubation. So you are going to see a high blood pressure, but it's uh, uh, the effect for norepinephrine, OK? We intubate the patient. Uh, we don't have problem to intubate the patient. So if you see here, it's suppression rate cortical. So we, we turn down the, the propofol induction in, in that time. And the patient goes, goes well. If you see here, uh, this is a monitor that we have to learn about that in cases, uh, over cases, because medication could alter uh, the, the lecture of the monitor. But you can, you can uh, wait three or five minutes, and then the, the monitor uh, it will be OK, showing the, the, the nociception index. Okay, this is a non-invasive uh, instrumentation, and we have here. Uh, we can see uh, we have interference with the neurosense monitoring. So this is going to alter the SPI, PSI. So uh, you can see the spectrogram. You can see that this patient is so so fragile because uh, we see 2.5 goes down and 0.7 is, is the, the, the drug amount. And I think he, uh, I, I have him in 0.5 of TCI of propofol because of this uh, um, suppression rate in the monitor. So we do all, all the case. And he was stable. He rise. The brain, uh, the, the thing, the interesting thing in, in the monitoring uh, of the brain is that in all the case, you have to rise and get down the, the propofol, the dose of propofol, because of the brain uh, have so many uh, different states in all the anesthesia technique. So if you don't see the brain, you must be in suppression, uh, in suppression rate, and you cannot uh, be aware of that. And sometimes the patient need, uh, like, like the, in this case, in the same case, we use 2.5 in the induction, then 0.7, then 0.5, and here 2.2, no? Uh, all of the, in all of the surgery can, can change the management. So here is another uh, multimodal approach of a C-section with regional anesthesia. Here we use a small amount of morphine sometimes, sometimes don't for, because the patient it's always like with scratchy and, 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 the, and vomiting. So we can, we, if it's Mayan people, we don't use morphine. But the interesting thing that we use is this infiltration of dexmedetomidine, ketrolac, and ropivacaine. Is we have now like 8,000 patients. I don't uh, write them because uh, I work alone all the time, so uh, I, I don't have time to, to get data of the patients, but I have uh, all of the cases. And we manage the patient almost with only acetaminophen. It's only this one an example that you can you can do with ropivacaine. This is the technique for infiltration. You do with a spinal needle, and you do uh, the half of the dose that you um, use in the in the mus muscle layer, and then the half of the dose of 10 milliliters uh, we use in the in the subcutaneous tissue. 
So this, this uh, infiltration technique lasts more than 24 hours. The patient is okay without a pain. Francisco Lobo, I think it's, he's doing now. Um, um, uh, uh, Hernan Boveri, that is here from Argentina, is doing, and in Mass General Hospital now is starting a protocol with this technique. So it's, it's really nice for the patients. This is another example of a laparoscopic appendectomy that it's a more quickly surgery that we have to prepare all of the infusions, but you can do that in five, six minutes uh, when you have practice with this technique. And uh, almost all the time, I don't have time to do that, but, but, but it's better for the patient. And the management is almost the same, but here, it depends of your surgeon if do big, uh, big wounds or, or use uh, small ports. So maybe it's going to be five milliliter ml uh, to use. So this is an example of a patient that last one hour and 34. The patient was stable all of the surgery. Lidocaine, magnesium, dexmedetomium, propofol, and rocuronium was the technique. And if you see Annie, it's always in the, in the right place. And here is the zip uh, thing that, that Emory is telling. Okay, the, here is a lidocaine in bolus. So you can, you can see the rise of the, of the blockade of, of parasympathetic, the uh, sympathetic tone. Here it's an, uh, an, an alpha, um, reading of the of the patient and you are going to see that like the wake up of the patient is completely different of the patient that you have with narco narcotics no the patient is more awake more more um, conscious so you can you can chat with uh, them and do mini mental test before and and uh, the pass uh, to pack you the, of the patient they are uh, awake, co completely awake and without the pain. And it, this is the waking up of the patient. If you see, here is uh, for the extubation. And I am going to take it. Here is the patient, uh, like three minutes, she was talking with me. I covered her eyes because uh, uh, she told me to do that. This is an osteosynthesis. It, uh, the example of management is like uh, the same, the same thing. And this is a patient, an obese patient with difficult or airway, or like every Mayan people in my in my place, I always manage this this problem. And we have here a cannot ventilate. A, situation, we do eye gel, and we can see the patient was stable all of the surgery too, uh, good blood pressure, and here we don't, didn't do with uh, Annie, so I, I didn't know where I, I was in the sympathetic tone of the patient, but this is uh, the nice thing, what uh, they awake in, immediately you are going to see that she is asleep, she is with a, a nice EEG, and then I take out the, the eye gel, and I talk for she, and she is open her eyes. No? This is the same. Okay, thank you. No. <laughs> uh, so, uh, we can start to comment, to ask to Henry and uh, Barusa about uh, their approach. Uh, hello. Uh, hello. Nowadays, we are implementing uh, the opioids free anesthesia because of the AIRS protocol. Uh -huh, uh, yeah. So, uh, and because of that, we, we have to use opioids free anesthesia. And we use 
lidocaine, infusion, dexmedetomidine, uh, and ketamine. But my question is that what do you think it would be? I, I understand that uh, avoiding opioids, it would be better for the bowel movements and uh, anything else. But what do you think that would be the disadvantage of using a short-acting uh, opioid like, like remifentanil for the intraoperative <laughs> period that I, should, uh, that I would switch off at the end of the surgery? Uh, that would help me to decrease the amount of propofol and the other uh, analgesics that I may use. What do you think that would be the disadvantage of using remifentanil? Okay, uh, we have um, a resident that is working now with me, and that's um, that's the the first uh, concern that using opioids. So he started to to use remifentanil in my patients when he arrived uh, one year ago or two years ago with me, and one week after we are we were doing that, the personnel of nurses in PACU called me and say, doctor, what are you doing now? And I say, nothing, no, nothing different. No, you are doing something different because the patients have pain here. We have to manage the, the pain management here. So we don't, we don't want to do that because they are, uh, they are used to not um, manage pain in my patients. So if you tell me that is different, yes. In the perception of pain in the, in the patient after the surgery, yes. In the intraoperative, I don't have problem. But the call, the night call or to my cell phone, it's always when I put uh, an opioid intraoperatively. So I don't like calls <laughs> for pain management. So that's interesting. I mean, I can say I don't have nearly the experience that Marusa has with this. I, I don't have nearly the experience that Marusa has, you know, using the opioid-free technique. I still use opioids intraoperatively, but I use the other drugs, so I don't have to give as much. And and I, I can't tell you I've tracked everybody formally. Um, I mean, I, I've been looking for the hyperalgesia that people like, you know, that they comment about. And what I found is is that if I'm using the combinations, I don't see that. I have DEX along with lidocaine in addition to my being protocol, I don't see it. Um, but again, it's not a systematic. <coughs> that's why I wanted to, wanted to put these out. Do you have Hello? Okay, that's better. Yeah. yeah. That, that, that's why I, wanted to put, I think we wanted to put these ideas out there because I think it's worth like studying, you know, studying formally. Um, but, you know, what I have seen is that if we use a balanced technique and then we have a non-opioid or a minimal opioid strategy post-operatively, the patients do do much better. That, that you don't have the problems with like, you know, the, the constipation, you know, the pruritus, you know, the nausea and vomiting. It's, it's, it's much less. in Sweden, try to use the experience uh, of other centers. We don't have very big uh, systematic studies, but we do quite advanced uh, surgery, reconstructive surgery in different fields. And following the new trends or actually new streams in uh, different parts of the world, I have the same feeling like you have. I don't think that Europe is in such a crisis of not at all using the opioids, that we should be uh, afraid of using a well-studied and pretty simple drug in well-qualified hands. The problem is when you have a complex patient, when you have a long advanced surgery, uh, expected post-operative pain, or when you have a comorbidity where you have to be aware. So I think that it is an extremely good field of research and I would like to congratulate for your work there, but I still think that I would love to have a, a good old morphia for some things that are very simple, because it is, however, a keep it simple strategy. Thank you.
Fentanyl is a great track. And the example, th this is an old uh, discussion that we have since uh, some, some time ago. I think that example of uh, his resident, it's a poor management of the pharmacokinetics of ph Remy Fentanyl. And, uh, and I, I think that Remy Fentanyl, we are very, very low dose with DEX, it's a great combination. And there's a paper done by Johan Heder in Oslo showing that decreasing slowly the concentrations of remifentanil in the PACU almost abolish the events of hyperalgesia associated before to remifentanil. So uh, possibly what your resident uh, was doing was turn off the remifentanil oh. and uh, not decrease slowly. <laughs> And, uh, but I agree, I without tax <laughs> and without infiltration, uh, it's completely different. Uh, spine surgery, I, I, it's something like that. I'm going to tell you, like clinical cases, I'm doing a lot of spine surgery uh, and I start to have this infiltration after uh, uh, these uh, talks with Marusa with uh, Dex, Ketorolac and Dropivacaine. And neurosurgeons, they they notice when there is another technique on board, when the infiltration is different, and when there's no dex during the, 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 the surgery. They, they see the postoperative uh, pain scores and the postoperative behavior of the patients. It's absolutely different. Uh, not so good, obviously. My name is Clara. Um, I, I will apologize in advance because I don't use a lot of uh, EEG monitoring. So I'm on my uh, beginnings. And probably this is really a dumb question. So I apologize. No, no <laughs> so, question is dumb. So according to your protocol, you use a lot of drugs, right? And uh, for the, what I've been studying from the really basic stuff, you, the, um, the, the, the spectrum that each of the drugs uh, show uh, are different. So, and uh, they're, they're not alike. This, how do you know that it's the right way or in the right uh, depthness of, uh, of uh, anesthesia? I think America could uh, answer that question best than me. Yeah. For example, the mix of propofol and ketamine it's, uh, that you were talking this morning. No, it's, it, it's a very good question. So, so, so here, here's what happens. So the dominant pattern is set by the hypnotic or the, or the, or the ether. So let's say sevoflurane. Okay. So let's do two cases. Add index metatomity. Add index. Unless you bolus it or something like that, if you just start the infusion, you probably won't see the EEG change at all. And the reason is, remember, sevoflurane has an alpha oscillation, has a slow oscillation, so does DEX, so it's hidden. You won't see it. All right? But now do the same thing. Run sevoflurane or run propofol, now add ketamine. All right? Now because ketamine actually works against the alpha oscillation, you'll see it shift up. So it turns out there are about four, three or four like situations like this. So like, or for example, if you use Remy fentanyl, if you do a Remy fentanyl induction, you will see just large slow oscillations, right? But if you start Remy fentanyl after you started propofol sevoflurane, you won't see it because those oscillations are overseen by the by the propofol. So 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 that's where. And where the Remy fentanyl is really helping you primarily is with the anti nociception, not so much with making the person unconscious. So that's why you need a monitor which is really telling you you're getting the nociceptive effect. And so this really is starts to be predicated on being able to separate out, in a principled way, drugs that you're giving because you're using them to make someone unconscious and drugs that you're giving because you really want to control someone's yes. anti nociception. So, but we, we, could, we could do a chart, you know, pretty quickly with about three or four things, and I, and I think it could convince you that you could go through pretty much most of the options. Go ahead. Here. I have a complete second question. What was my follow-up? Why do you need to 
well as subcutaneously. Our question is why do you infiltrate intramuscularly as well as subcutaneously? Is it to make a depot or? That, that's a good question. Um, we infiltrate uh, because the receptors of pain uh, are in the muscle layer and then in the subcutaneous tissue. And the absorption of the drug uh, in the muscular uh, layer, it's like seven minutes, I think, uh, seven, nine minutes for dexmedetomidine, and for uh, ketorolac, it's immediately. Uh, we are looking for get a huge amount of ketorolac in the muscle layer to generate a, um, a not uh, arachino arachidonic acid to turn to pr prostaglandins and leukotrienes and all of that stuff. Cicloxygenas, uh, I think, in, in Spanish. <laughs> so um, we do that. And the exmedetomidine maintain open the, the arterias there. So uh, the movement of the treatus in the, in the cellular, in the muscular layer, is, it's more easy and more fluid with this uh, infiltration that if you do uh, IV now, never get the drug there where you need. Uh, and, and they have local, local um, action. So the patient is going to be a, a little bit sedated in, in the PACU because of the dexmedetomidine, but uh, you are going to see the, um, the evolution of the patient in the next Thursday. 36 hours. Uh, the patient for the C-section, for example, is a patient that they open the muscle layer and they pull the layer. So the pain of the of the C-section, you don't have a C-section, I, <laughs> I have a C-section. So the pain it's in the muscle layer, not not in the in the wound properly. No, so that that's uh, some the reason I do without muscle and muscle and the patients go better observation thing in the in the muscle. Okay. Someone perfect. Well okay. I'm more a regional anesthesia uh, anesthesiologist. So uh, have you tried um, combining because you're, everyone is, is um, want to stop the in the the entry of the nociceptive um, stimulus. Input. So probably, if you could combine not all of the of the cases, of course, but there are a lot of techniques now that have been described that can be applied for spine surgery, for example. I uh, do that before the incision, if you wish. Most of the times they are applied after, but I think that you can get the most of it if you do it before. That's because a you can uh, there are papers that say that it's done problem if you do uh, before or after. You can do that. I do regional anesthesia. I have an experience with uh, trauma uh, patients with shoulder uh, technique, and we have this problem with uh, when the patient is getting out the, the effect of the regional anesthesia, they feel pain. Yeah, because if of the, the throwback, the, the drawback, uh, no, a breakthrough pain, is that it? Uh -huh. it because of the hyperalgesia. Yes. It's one moment, like a half an hour, I think, or 45 minutes, but the mm. patient is in pain. And we uh, are doing now uh, infiltrate the, the wound and regional anesthesia for uh, pain management after the surgery, and they go better with the infiltration. With the infiltration. Yes. With the dexmedetomidine, is that it? Yes, ketorolac and you know, My theory is that because uh, if you feel no pain at all uh, with the regional anesthesia, if you get the first pain, it will be also it will be horrible <laughs> because you experience no pain at all. I, that's why I don't really think there's an hyperalgesia. I think that no, no, the no first time the patient feels pain, they will s say that it was very severe. That's but the th that's my theory. It's not. It's not described. Uh, have you have you um, used uh, Have you tried or think about using the dex dexmedetomidine interfascial between the fascial layers? Yes. 
Yes? And what the is your ESP, experience? The duration is not the same. Do you, do, it's not the same as the subcutaneous? No. I use uh, to do tap lock, yeah. ESP. I do regional anesthesia with ultrasound and, and I do because I like it. I enjoy it. But not for the, it's better for the patient. So uh, I, I don't know if. if, if Okay. I have a question for Emery, and uh, there's a lot of reports uh, of colleagues saying that uh, when reversing a neuromuscular blockage with Sugamadex, the patients are um, awakening faster. I know you have te a theory, but uh, if you don't mind to give us your uh -huh. opinion about this. Yes, please. <laughs> Uh, well, I, I think that what's going, I think the effect that people are seeing is very real. I mean, I, I don't think they're imagining it. And uh, I think that what's occurring is, um, and this is something that I alluded to but I didn't go into. So for years people have talked about max bearing effects of uh, muscle relaxants, that when they have muscle relaxants on board, they need you know, less of the inhaled drugs. And so a couple of years ago, uh, one of the medical students from Leeds, Chris Jones, came and spent time with me and I said, can you help me understand, can you work out the pathways of, uh, you know, how muscle relaxants, let's say, are affecting arousal. And what he did was, he, he worked on it all summer and one day he comes to me and he goes, oh, Professor Brown, I think I got it, you know. <laughs> and, and what he had figured out was that, so we have, we talk about proprioception, okay. So proprioception is the feedback coming from the muscles that basically tells the brain where the limb is, right? Where the arms are, where the legs are, this sort of thing. So here's the key point. The proprioceptive feedback that comes from the lower extremities goes up the sensory pathways, all right? The same way a sensation does. But then it actually splits. It goes to the cerebellum, all right? From the cerebellum, the cerebellum sends it back into the brain stem it also sends it directly to the cortex, right? Now, one of the things about this is when you see someone that has a cerebellar stroke, they often don't have motor defects, they actually have cognitive defects primarily, right? So there's a very strong input going from the cerebellum into these various cognitive areas. So when you give muscle relaxant, what you're doing is you're blocking that proprioceptive feedback such that now, because the gamma is seemingly so effective, it's very, very specific. It's pretty much acting all at once. So you get a, a very probably quick return of that proprioceptive feedback. And I think that's the sort of wake up phenomenon that people are seeing. I think it is in the motor system, but it's very clear the anatomy of how the, like in the upper extremities, the upper extremities don't go to the cerebellum. They just go directly up the sensory pathways and then on to S1 and S2. So it's this amplification from the lower extremities that probably helps us out. Thank you. So, thanks. Any other questions? So first, Brad, uh, looking at the power spectrum you've shown today, uh -huh. uh, you talked about understanding. Right. Towards the end of the anesthetic. Right. I noticed looking at the power spectrum you presented today at the beginning, it looks like all your patients no, it, it really is the technique, and it just shows you. So, I mean, basically, if you look historically, the reason we started using like barbiturates to induce patients was that the surgeons got really antsy and couldn't wait. And so that's why, the, because everybody used to get breathed down with ether, and that took a long time, you know, 20 minutes, sometimes 30 minutes. So what we've gotten into is this habit, and, I, and I'm guilty of it too, of just giving a bolus of propofol. You know, and so the, you know, the, the purest, the pure like Tiva guy will just let it infuse in, infuse in. And if you do that, you will actually see, you know, like these other, you know, the, the sort of states going from like the beta right into the alpha and the slow oscillation. But when you bolus it like we're doing, and especially these older patients, you're going to go right to birth suppression. And that, and that it, it is the technique. It really, really is the technique. But I also realize that for some of the older people, it is next to impossible to keep some of them out of birth suppression. And that's what I was showing like in one of those latter cases.
I think that we have time for the last question from Brazil. Philippe? Hello. Uh, Manu, uh, I have uh, experience about uh, 500 cases in opioid free anesthesia. So, um, two questions, simply. Do you use or in how, how many times you use a beta blockers? Beta. In your, never? Never. Okay. Only one time last week I have to use it. Okay. In a maxillar. And uh, another one, uh, how deep is your neuromuscular block? Uh, I show the uh, lumbar spine fixation with zero of zero and PTC. C zero it's in the in the fractures. And with one hundred I, I, I give Sugamadex for the for ventilation of the patient in the in the non invasive with neuromonitoring. So I don't use rock you, uranium you don't in the use, uh, in ten uh, hours of surgery, no. Oh. Okay. The patient is, is ventilated alone. Okay.